I would say the name has a, a lot of meaning, but one of them is that uh, um, we like the color gray because it's, um, it's not completely black, it's not completely white, um, it's somewhere in the middle and that also allows for a lot of color and as you will see we, we do like color and we do appreciate what color can do in terms of communication and what we can say. And so it refers to this middle condition in a way and to, uh, I would say, also the condition of the city in which we operate in an everyday basis as a young office. Uh, we work mostly in, uh, with urban planning, but we also work mostly in, let's say, the more suburban condition of the city, in the weaker condition of the city, but that is always connected to strong metropolitan uh, issues, scales, and, and relationships. And so the, the color gray for us is a, uh, is a representation of all that. Um, the main, as I said, the main, I would say, sub, really subject of, uh, that we deal with every day in our office, and uh, which is our interest, is housing. Um, and, and the way we read the city of housing uh, is, is making city with housing for us. Um, we, uh, we like housing because for us, it relates to the urban tradition, no matter where it is, if it's in the suburban landscape, uh, in a more rural one, or in the city center, housing always relates to, to an urban condition in the sense that it, it is inhabited. And, um, and it's also for us, and for when we started the office, which was in 2010, in the middle of uh, the crisis, and uh, in the middle of the housing crisis that is ongoing today, uh, making city with housing was also, and is also today, I would say, um, a political and a societal challenge that we are faced with every day uh, in the project that we are dealing with. And so uh, this issue for us is uh, it's central in everything that we do, and, um, and we mostly uh, work with projects that involve housing. Um, so making city with housing, um, how do you do it? How, what is the... Uh, um, what, what are the different subjects that, that you can deal with? Well, first, first of all, for us, it's, um, it has to uh, deal with the living qualities of what it is to live uh, within one house, within one unit. And uh, for that, we think it's a really interesting time that we're in today because the, the position and the, the quality and lifestyles are shifting today. Um, <clears throat> there is blurry lines between uh, um, the public and the private, between the work and leisure uh, that puts housing in, a, in another condition in the city. There's also a change compositions in terms of families. We still design mostly housing units for the traditional nuclear family, while we know at the same time that compositions of uh, families are shifting and changing uh, quite a lot. And there has also been in the last 10 years with smartphones, with apps, etc., new uh, sharing systems also that allow for uh, planning different kind of shared spaces when it comes to housing that also has an impact on the, the, the housing unit itself. So all these lifestyle changes for us puts housing into, uh, again, into the center of the, of the urban condition and makes it uh, very interesting and very important also to look at housing from within. But it's also uh, for us an, uh, a question about form, about the urban form of the city because uh, when we need to build a lot of housing, which is the case uh, today in France, it's the case also in, in Sweden, and I'll speak a little bit about that. I think it's the case in Germany, everywhere in Europe, and, and in on other continents too. When we need to build a lot, uh, we uh, need to do it quite often in monofunctional settings today. We are not uh, in the position uh, like in the 90s or in the beginning of the 2000s, where we, at least in France, we built a lot of mixed-use neighborhoods, etc. Now we are really talking about building a critical mass of housing. And uh, it has an impact on the way we shape our city. It has an impact on the urban form. And that is something that we're very uh, interested in. This relationship between the housing unit, the typology, and, uh, and the urban form. So when we work on this issue in the office, we have developed a series of tools um, that I will speak about through the different projects, but one of them, as you, as you can see here, is that we use a lot of references uh, of existing projects by other architects that we find interesting in certain contexts. We redraw them uh, and we use them as a working tool. Uh, I will explain that a bit, a bit later. And we also use a lot of color um, 
here you, you can see that all the housing plans are drawn in red. They're always systematically drawn in red at the office. It's a choice. Um, it helps us to have a common language uh, within the office. Uh, when we speak about something, if it's red, we know it's housing. Uh, it's as simple as that. But it's also a choice, the color red for us, uh, to put the urgency on the question of housing uh, rather than on another issue. And so working on, on housing and on the housing issue for us relates a bit to, to the fact that we're in between. And we're really working between uh, the architectural scale and between the urban scale. Uh, we have, we do design buildings, but we're not uh, only doing that on our own site. And we are not only working uh, from, let's say, the, the master plan scale. We are really in the middle of that. And this, um, I would say, zoom in, zoom out approach that we try to have on every project um, is a way for us to try also to think of an architecture and of a housing that is uh, adequate and that is within our times. So I will go through a few of our projects, trying to explain this approach a bit further. I will start and I will speak mainly about Bordeaux, but I will finish at the end uh, talking a little bit about Stockholm because there are, um, to some extent, very similar issues that I want to raise. So when we started the office in 2010, we were very lucky uh, to have our first commission <laughs> that was precisely in the middle of this issue that I'm speaking about. Um, it was called 50,000 Dwellings. It was an um, international consultation that was launched by the region, uh, the metropolitan region of Bordeaux, that selected five teams, and we entered with a Belgian architectural office, 51 and 40. That's how we got in. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we were asked, along with four other teams, to reflect on the question of how we can build 50,000 dwellings within the metropolitan region of, of Bordeaux. Bordeaux, as, as uh, some of you may know, it is a city in the southwest part of, of France. It's a quite attractive city, but it's also quite isolated city. There are not uh, the, the big the big cities are, are not very close by. The closest one is Toulouse, and it's still two hours from, uh, from Bordeaux, so it's in a quite isolated uh, urban condition. But it's very attractive. It's attractive because of its uh, famous wine, but also because of the climate, um, proximity to, uh, uh, to the sea. Uh, it's a horizontal city also, and that is important because uh, um, in a sense, that makes it very specific from other French cities, I would say. Even close to the very city center, you will find these kinds of units, which are called ishop, which is a traditional uh, housing typology of Bordeaux, which is a, a only one story on the street side, and then the garden behind is a little bit lower, so sometimes you find uh, a second level. But it's a very horizontal city. Uh, with a few emerging uh, objects, such as collective housing, of course, and then you have the the uh, churches that you see uh, from time to time in the city center, as you can see from on the image here. Um, so it's a, it's a very attractive city and it has become even more attractive uh, within the seven years that we have now been working on it. Um, but at the time, in 2010, this consultation was launched um, with the objective to try to have a critical perspective on how we should use housing. As you can see on the, on the little sketch uh, on the top, this is just the evolution that was in 2010, the projected evolution of inhabitants within, uh, within Bordeaux. So in 2010, there were 720,000 inhabitants within the metropolitan uh, region of Bordeaux, which is the city of Bordeaux and 26 other cities around. Uh, and the projection was that by 2020, we would reach 840,000 inhabitants. So there was, as you can see, the, the the movement is slowly shifting upward, but it's not something, um, it's not a critical uh, shift, it's something that is quite continuous. But there was a clear choice from the region to try to reflect on how we produce housing. Because there was a need for housing, so how we produce means how can we do it a little bit faster, of course, but also how can we do it cheaper, and how can we do it with better qualities. And for us it was a quite, groundbreaking, I would say, uh, commission, because it clearly asked the question of how, uh, of how you can think of the quality of housing, 
yet at the same time thinking of quantity. Often you are used to uh, uh, dealing with one or the other. Quality in terms of asked to produce a building, uh, design a housing building, uh, where you focus really on the quality of housing, and on the other side, you in master planning, sometimes they ask you, okay, now just put 20,000 units on this, on this plan, and we talk about the quantity. Also in politics, you tend to talk about the quantity, uh, while in, as planners and architects, we, uh, uh, we tend to want to speak about the quality. And this was an issue that tried to put both these uh, subjects on the same level, and we found that very interesting. Uh, and we tried during the process to really focus on, on dealing with these two subjects at the same time. What it means to talk about 50,000, but never forgetting that 50,000 is also each time one housing unit next to the other, and speaking about the quality. And it was also for us, in that sense, a way to finally try to have um, to work on the relationship between the typology, the housing typology, and the living qualities, and the urban form that it generates as a quantitative uh, project. So when we started, we uh, um, we didn't have a very scientific approach uh, because it was, I mean, it wasn't a scientific project per se. It was a uh, the teams were transdisciplinary, of course, but it was a short first time of a six month. We were asked to produce ideas on the table, and so the first ideas were these that are represented in these four uh, little drawings. It was four hypotheses that we made from the start, which were based on the, let's say, the quality that we found in Bordeaux. The first one is called housing plus transport equals city. Uh, that was the idea that in a city like Bordeaux, which is very horizontal, which is very isotropic in the movements, if you have housing and if you have good transportation, then you are ultimately living in an urban environment. The second hypothesis, which is on the top on the, to the right, is the called territorial predominance. It was the idea that you have the city center of Bordeaux, which is very strong uh, today, but you also have territorial qualities. Uh, you have the sea, which is not far away. You have strong natural elements, which can act as a counterweight. And so that you can stop looking at the city like the center versus the periphery, and you can really start at looking at different uh, strong qualities within this whole area. The third one was called scales of mixed use, and again, it's, it spoke about the fact that if you have good transportation, you maybe do not need at one spot everything at the same time. So when you're not able to produce mixed use neighborhoods such as we find in the city center now, uh, if you have good transportation, it is still okay because you can live somewhere and maybe you are a five minute bike ride from a movie theater, maybe you are a 20 minute by tramway station from a shopping center and you can actually live in different kind of scales and, and still be in a very urban environment and it makes it okay to plan only housing at some places. And the fourth hypothesis, which is the one which uh, is a bit cutting, uh, was called horizontal and emerging densities and it was the idea that Bordeaux as a horizontal city, uh, if we are to densify it, uh, we should try to do it on the existing qualities, uh, but radicalize them. So we spoke about horizontal densities as, as trying to increase the density of the horizontal city, but also of new emerging uh, densities uh, that would be interesting to implement. And then we started to have a semi-scientific approach to it, in the sense that we looked at the zoning plans of the, of the city. Uh, it was done quite quickly, but we looked at the zoning plans, we looked at where there were clear opportunities to build, and we came up with a general, um, very general strategic plan, which you can see here, where you see Bordeaux in the center, uh, you see the Garonne, which runs through uh, the city, uh, you see the nature all around, and in, um, in light, I would say red or pink color, it's uh, the built up spaces where there is possibility to still densify and in the, the more red colors you see different kind of potentials in terms of new uh, sites to urbanize uh, that are in different conditions. And so we looked at these uh, different opportunities. It's very disappointing, it's still here at Sturman, uh, your form of the monthly institution. So we looked at these different uh, opportunities in terms of uh, areas and we uh, 
projected densities on these different types of sites, and we came up with the conclusion that on these different sites that you see here, there was a potential for building uh, certainly 50,000 dwellings, but up to uh, 89,000 dwellings. So it was a quantitative approach, uh, which one can criticize, um, certainly, uh, to its, uh, uh, because we chose a number of uh, density on certain sites, which were, uh, some other people may argue that this density could not be as uh, much or should be higher. So it wasn't just, again, it wasn't, and I insist on that because I think it's very important, it wasn't a scientific approach, but it was a way for us also to deal with quantity and also to deal with critical mass. And then in parallel to this more quantitative approach, we started to draw um, existing housing plans of, uh, of other architects, which were some of them based in France, other, other ones based uh, um, in other countries, in Europe and uh, even outside of Europe. These are all examples that we chose because they were relevant to us to um, the Bordeaux project in terms of offering life qualities that could be adequate to the climatic conditions of Bordeaux, offering densities also that could be interesting to achieve. And it was, in the beginning, it wasn't a closed toolbox. It's not to say this is what we should build in Bordeaux uh, tomorrow only, but it was a way to start to speak from the beginning of the interior qualities of housing. And also it was a way for us to be able to bridge the gap between the housing itself and the general critical mass of housing. Because the way we worked, and the plan is in very bad quality here, but uh, the way we worked is that we had a series of test sites that were attributed to us from the, from the public authority. And um, we used the references, the projects that we applied on the territory. First of all, it, it allowed us to try things quite quickly uh, on the plan and to, to make up uh, new neighborhoods quite quickly, but it also allowed us at the same time to always be quite precise in the housing qualities that were proposed and at the same time also knowing the critical mass that we were building. Because it wasn't just about volumes being put on a site, where we could evaluate that we have these many dwellings, we really knew how much we were putting and what they were generating in terms of relationship between each other. Here, for example, you have a test which is about uh, with 189 dwellings, so it's a density of about 80 dwellings per hectare. And then we, each time, we made a model, always in red, always to speak about housing as the main issue within this, uh, this consultation. Just showing you a few other examples that we did on test sites, which are very different. This is a, a, in another context, it's in the northern part of Bordeaux. It's close to an industrial site. Uh, this is a very low-rise, low-density development. You have 21 dwellings per hectare. It's completely different. Um, looked like this in the model. Here is yet another example, which is a completely different context again, uh, but still an exercise made an exercise that we did by using only these existing typologies that we had selected. Uh, here you have about 300 or 346 dwellings, and it's say the density of 47 dwellings per hectare. So it was, of course, a, let's say more of a theoretical exercise, but it allowed us to speak about the relationship between the typology, the living quality, and the urban environment that is generated. And I would say it worked because uh, this was in 2011 and 12 that we did the, this, this first phase. And then there was a, um, a new organism that was created that is called La FAP, which is a public authority that is uh, dealing only with the production of these 50,000 dwellings. So they have an ongoing work uh, ever since the 2012 to implement and to make sure that different projects are being built. And we have a, a contract with, with them that is going on uh, currently today, uh, in which we uh, regularly look up new sites and test uh, the possibilities of these sites to be able to implement to dwellings and to, to create urban quality. This is just an example, doesn't speak so much of the project, but this is an example that we did just a couple of months ago for them. And so here we have, uh, on the western part of Bordeaux, it's, uh, it's close to, a, it's right next to a big, big shopping mall, and there will, uh, there's a potential here for 231 dwellings. And uh, we regularly do uh, these exercises, 
and many of them, I would say many, a few of them, it's many for, for us in a sense, a few of them have uh, gone over to becoming their competitions for architecture, architects them to build within, and uh, some of them will uh, quite soon be, be finished as projects. So this approach, this way of really trying to be between the, uh, the, the housing unit in itself and the urban landscape for us is, a, um, is quite a productive way, I would say, of working with this issue of housing. Um, this first project, so the 50,000 dwellings, it brought us, of course, a certain knowledge of the, of the territory of Bordeaux and uh, the quality of the, of the, let's say, the urban fabric. And so it brought us to another commission that was for the city of Bordeaux this time uh, on an existing neighborhood of Bordeaux, which is called Coudiron. Uh, it's a residential area with about 20,000 existing uh, dwellings within it. It's a project that we did with landscape architects uh, Michel Courageau and Pierre Courageau uh, between 2013 and 14. And ever since that, we have accompanied the city in the evolution of this neighborhood. And we just uh, came out in, in September this year with a publication on the on the neighborhood, which is called in French Apprendre de Coderon, which means learning from Coderon. Uh, it's about how we can learn from this type of residential urban fabric. Here you see the, the map of Bordeaux, so we're, this time we're really close to the city center, we're within the municipal border of Bordeaux. Um, and Bordeaux is known in France, I don't know outside, but it's known as the city of stone, because it's a very, um, we find a lot of stone in the city center. There's a lot of green, but it's very hidden. And so when you're in the middle of the city in the summer, it gets quite hot. Um, and here you have a representation just of the city center of Bordeaux along with the Garonne. And what you see attached to it is actually the, the residential area of Coderon, which we call from the beginning the city of nature because it's very green. And there's a real contrast when you move from one to the other. It has quite a specific shape in terms of a relationship to, to the city, and it's because up until 1967, it was another city, which was then annexed to, to Bordeaux uh, to become part of the city. This is it, uh, almost everything of it. It's, so it's 750 hectares. There are 45,000 inhabitants today, about 20,000 dwellings. And as you can see, it's quite green. Uh, and there's actually a lot of natural quality uh, everywhere, uh, but it's a complex neighborhood in the sense that no one really understands and reads the quality of it. Um, it's quite criticized today by a lot of people who says that it just looks like a big soup. Uh, and there's a, a, a lot of densification going on, but also a lot of people trying to block the project because uh, what is happening is they are taking one unit with a site with one house and developers are coming in and they are wanting to build um, a collective building with 30 units and people get mad and they stop the project and everything is blocked. And so the city uh, launched this commission in order to, first of all, to make an urban study of the neighborhood because it had never been done, but also to try to find ways to uh, move forward with existing projects and to be able to come up with um, clearer rules in how you can densify this neighborhood. And so to simplify it, and it's really a simplification, but we can say that we're in this third condition of uh, the drawing that said, right, it's made of the city as an egg, we're in the scrambled version. And it's literally, it's, it, you can really feel it, and it's, uh, and I like scrambled eggs, so it's, uh, there's definite quality to it, but it's, um, for people who live in it, it's quite a rich neighborhood also. For people who live in it and who like order, just like the French do, um, there's a lot to be criticized. And so we started the project trying to just look at the existing, because essentially uh, this was not a commission where we could come and say, oh, you can build this much here and you should redesign this. It's all built up. It's all. Everything is private also, in a sense, so there was very little public land for us to really have an impact on. So it's more about looking, trying to see what rules we can come up with for the neighborhood to be able to evolve and to densify in time without losing its qualities. So we started by looking at the existing, and what we noted was that there's a lot of nature, a lot of green, but there's also a clear correspondence every time between uh, the built form 
and the landscape form. So it's quite stupid, but when you have a small house, you have a small tree. And when you have a big uh, collective unit, you have really big trees. It sounds stupid, but this is not the case everywhere at all. It comes from the fact that the collective uh, residences within these neighborhoods, they were built in huge parks from the beginning, and they kept the trees. And so, the let's say the collective landscape, the greenery that is collective within the city, actually comes from the collective units within Codéron. And this was something very interesting because we did a lot of walks with the, with the uh, inhabitants of Codéron through the city uh, to talk with them about, about the city. And um, each time we told them, you know, but you criticize the collective uh, buildings, but it's also within the collective that you have the green spaces. And uh, they realized this after a while. I said, yeah, it's true, actually. The, green, the big green space that I see at the bottom of my street is, yeah, it comes from the collective. If it was only individual, it would not be the same. So we really noted that there was a quality, a strong relationship between landscape and built form, and that this was also contributing to, to the quality. You can just see a few images of, of what it looks like. Um, you can really get a sense, at least, that it's quite green, that it's very mixed also, uh, but that there is always this strong relationship between the landscape and uh, the built form. And you can also see the quality in the city of Bordeaux of the landscape. As I said, when you're in the city center of Bordeaux in the summer, it's very hot, and it's only going to get hotter and um, tougher in the summer. And here you have the potential of the quality of the, of the green space, which is very important. And so we looked at the existing uh, neighborhood, and we started to try to distinguish different kind of qualities relating to these different landscape qualities. And we, we came up with more or less four different urban fabric which were existing. And I'm just going to go through them very quickly. This is the first one, it's the individual one, where you always have individual houses, but also most of the time with a little small front garden that is planted. It makes up 36% uh, of the whole territory of Codéron. You have the collective fabric, which you can really identify as being, um, you have very big, as I said, uh, collective residences with high uh, quality of uh, landscape, and which take up at some pieces, you can see there, quite a lot of space, and it makes up about 33% of uh, the surface of Codéron. Then there is something which we call the mixed or the more hybrid, where there is really something more diverse going on, and it's also much denser in terms of development. And as you can see, it's also mostly along the general uh, main axis that goes towards the city center of Bordeaux. It's about 13.5% of the whole territory. And the fourth one is this traditional uh, Bordeaux typology that I spoke about, which is called Ishop. And here you see a street of only traditional Ishop. Some of them have been raised, but where you have this situation where you have a unit which uh, goes all the way to the street, and then you have the landscape bad quality of the drums, but you have really a strong green landscape that is within, but it's it. And this is more of what you have towards the city center of Bordeaux. And so these four different urban fabrics, um, we identify them and we try to say that within the densification of this whole neighborhood, if we don't want to keep blocking the project uh, and all the time, maybe we should try to concentrate on the qualities of each one of these fabrics and try to come up with um, typologies that work in terms of densification. So uh, it was the idea what that this drawing shows that we can really optimize each one of these fabrics, uh, both in terms of landscape qualities, but also in terms of housing offer. And that we can really densify the whole area quite, quite a lot in time but if we only do it trying to uh, be contextual and keep with the existing qualities. And so we, we did uh, work with different developers also, we organized meetings, etc., and we came up with, with a few of, let's say, typologies that would fit really well uh, into the context because they are already there or because they, uh, they relate to the existing context. We have uh, four of them here, which is an individual plus, which is just a densification of the individual unit, which is already happening a lot. Uh, there is something that we call approximate living, and I'm going to get back to, to that. 
There is the urban villa, um, smaller version than what uh, Anthony Gimbuti is doing, but, uh, uh, but let's say the, the same qualities. And then there is the big collective residence. There is still a lot of room for, for uh, designing big collective residences here, uh, all the while keeping the landscape. And uh, there are really excellent models within the within the uh, within Codemont that shows how how the collective quality can really be present. Here is just a few existing examples of what is being done. This is a Bordeaux architect who has a, a, who has made his extension in the neighborhood of Codemont. This is existing urban villas within Codemont. Uh, it's uh, between um, eight and ten uh, apartments within one uh, large villa uh, that you actually find there. Uh, this is Lacaton like Aversal, not in Coderon, but uh, right uh, close to it in Bordeaux, making, uh, showing, showcasing quite, quite clearly the, the quality that you can find in the big collective residences. And then there is this fourth um, <coughs> typology, which we call proximate living. Um, when we started the 50,000 housing project, um, there was this debate about how you can design individual housing in Bordeaux, because people like the individual quality, uh, but in order to keep it, we need to go denser. And so we started to look at a lot of references, and this came back in this project. Uh, and it, because, as I said, it doesn't relate only to the condition of Codemont. Here you see a map of the whole re metropolitan region of uh, Bordeaux, and it's really a horizontal metropolis in reality, and it's a horizontal metropolis in terms of regulation. Because, as you can see here, the red, which makes up 56%, of all the urban built areas today in terms of zoning plan are blocked at two levels. It means in all the red areas you cannot build above two levels. And it's not even a question about height, it's, uh, which it often is. Sometimes they say you cannot build more than eight meters and then you can really squeeze in a small a third level sometimes if you're lucky. But this is really a, a zoning regulation that says two stories maximum in all these red areas. Some people say this is disastrous, uh, it's madness in the, in the time where we need to build denser. Uh, this is a choice that the city, that the region has made, and so we are trying to see how within this fabric you can try to go denser uh, in keeping the existing qualities, but go denser because you need to go denser. Here you can just see a zoom of, of what kind of fabric, and we are really close to the city center in these different uh, zones. And so we looked at, um, and we turned to the United States and to the 60s for a lot of these references because they have, I mean, in the, on the West Coast there are a lot of really excellent references in terms of horizontal living but in denser um, situation. This is a Maple Apartments by Craig M. Wood. It's in Los Angeles. We visited it. It's, um, well, some of them have actually grouped the units together so they're larger today, but it was initially, it was four units, small units, each one had their apartment spot in the, in the front, and it's a, it's a much denser version of, let's say, what, what you find around, but still with strong individual qualities. And we also found this project, which is one of the case study apartments, the, one of the only two case study apartments, because the other one were individual houses, which was designed by uh, Beetle Daily Associates and that we were located in Phoenix, Arizona. And we found this project so interesting that we decided to go and uh, see it. And we went to Phoenix uh, and been twice ever since to, uh, to look at this project. And what we discovered uh, uh, was also a whole other range of, of projects. Phoenix and Arizona, and I'm just going to speak very briefly about it, but um, it's a nice climate, I would say too nice climate maybe, but that's about the only comparison you can make to Bordeaux. It's in the middle of the uh, desert in Arizona, uh, it's very spread out, but it's one of the most attractive cities in the United States today in terms of of a demographic uh, change. A lot of people are coming in and it's very attractive, just as, just as Las Vegas actually. Um, and so, of course, it has the sun, it attracts people for, for the sun, but it's also quite dynamic city in what happens today. This is a, a picture of a project by the same architect as the one I, I just showed, and it's called Three Fountains Apartments in St. Phoenix. Um, and we uh, visited it and it's one of the I would say almost the only project that we have seen which is 
ten times better in real life than what you see on the photos. Usually, it's the, it's the opposite when you visit, and it's a it's a complex of, of um, individual units or kind of sort of garden apartments, 59 units grouped together, uh, two stories high, uh, and they have a common space which is very uh, green and which is covered by like this, this webs. Uh, which is very nice because of the climate there in the sun, which is really sharp. Um, and so all of these units open up to the collective space, and then they have a small garden patio, uh, really small, but on the back. Uh, this was one of the, the people we met, that a very nice man. Um, and so they look like this, but they're, what is really exceptional in this project is not necessarily the architecture itself, and you can like the architecture or not, but it's really the, the urban quality and the urban fabric that is generated through individual housing. Here you do not have a juxtaposition of individual houses. You create, Alfred Beadle was the architect, he created an urban environment that is truly, uh, that is truly amazing. You walk through it. Uh, the system also, the way it's work is, it works is you have uh, two, this one. you have two lateral alleys here. So you enter with the car and then you park which means that the collective space in the middle is entirely free of cars, uh, very un-American. And it actually feels very urban when you're there because you don't see people walking on the street in Phoenix, but you have people walking in this central space. And so it's, it's very urban, it's very qualitative in nature, and it's super dense compared to what you have around. And it's really fascinating. This is another one of his projects um, where you can see a clear reference to Mies, which, uh, uh, which was maybe his only reference almost uh, in terms of architecture, but I think he pushed his principles so much further and it's much more interesting in architect in some aspect than, than Mies to look at. Um, but this is another project which is called the Boardwalk. It's 34 units, so it's only uh, one story, so it's a little bit less dense. But it's a bit of the same principle. Here you have the units that open up to a big uh, collective space in the middle. And there is this play with the vegetation and the, the landscape, which makes it, uh, they are all completely open, the units, but you still manage to create um, different levels of privacy through the, uh, through the greenery and the way it's arranged. And uh, people are, uh, all of the people that we spoke with, they, uh, they enjoy living here. And they have, a, also for elderly people, it's a very friendly environment to, to live in. And people have, they have a common gardener that take care of, takes care of the space. But if they want to uh, use the space as they wish, if they want to garden the way they, they wish, they can do it. And so there's a real diversity also in terms of quality that is produced. Here's more of a diagrammatic plan of the system, but essentially it's the same one. All the units are oriented towards a, a, a shared common space through which you walk, uh, you park on one side, and then each unit have a very, very small, it's not a patio, but a very, very small opening to, uh, to the back. Um, and so here you can just see a comparison of the, let's say, the urban footprint of Bordeaux versus the urban footprint of, of Phoenix. Um, and Bordeaux is really four times more dense than Phoenix. And I'm speaking about the city, not about uh, uh, the metropolitan area. But uh, so it, it is not comparable in terms of density, but still these projects that I just showed you, uh, they are very dense even for uh, the Bordeaux condition. And they create something that we find truly exceptional, this, this capacity of producing an urban fabric only through housing. And, and I think if I would say one image or, or one, one project in the world that um, can sum up this idea about the relationship between the architectural typology and the urban form and the capacity to make city with housing, it would be this, uh, this image and this project by Alfred Beadle uh, in Arizona, which was in, done in 1963 and which is still uh, a very, very up-to-date uh, today. And so we are, are working on uh, trying to get out a publication about this architect, which we're very passionate about. Um, of course, you have to do the work in between, so it takes a lot of time. But uh, hopefully, it will be uh, it will be out in not too 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 much time. And so we went twice to Phoenix during uh, during the time we worked on Coderon. And when we came back, we showed this project to the city. We showed it to developers, and we showed it as a potential prototype in the way we could produce also a qualitative urban environment 
with uh, individual drugs. And we met uh, one developer, which is called Credit Agricole, which is originally a bank, and is a developer today, like many of them. And um, they asked us to try to implement the principles of, of, these, uh, of this project in Bordeaux. And the, the principles we have called is proximate living because it, it really relates to this quality of, of creating the right proximity between units and between housing, all the while keeping the individual quality. And so we, uh, we are working currently, it's, um, it's currently stopped because it's blocked by people uh, that live around it. As I said, a lot of projects are being blocked, but hopefully it will go on the way. It's on an existing site that you can see here, about 2,000 square meters. And um, we, we did a project, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but of 15 individual dwellings uh, on this parcel, uh, which are built on a 5 by 5 meter grid. Um, and here you can see the, the units. The parking here is underground, uh, so it's, uh, it's invisible in the parcel. Um, and you have very simple units. Um, not the same as, as in the projects that I showed you because it's uh, uh, not the same uh, sizes also in Europe compared to the, the United States, but quite common uh, uh, individual unit for parent layout. And this is an image of what, uh, what the project looked like. As you can see, it's really, it, it's a clear inspiration by this project and the principle. Then it's a, a, the, the outlook in the end will be different, but, the, but this idea of the collective space in the middle towards which the building turn uh, will be uh, will be there. And it was quite funny for us because this is not a traditional kind of, of collective space that you will find in French projects. Uh, people tend to look for individual housing, uh, which are much more closed off. Uh, but the developer are quite confident that this, is, uh, that this is going to work because the quality that is being put into the central space in terms of landscape, the budget of the landscape was also much higher than on a traditional project, uh, is quite confident that the quality of this collective space that you find in the middle um, will be enough to attract people to the project. And it's, it's really also for us um, it really relates to the importance, let's say, between the built form of housing and, and landscape forms that you, that you find associated to it. And as I said, it's, um, we, we cut down, for example, on the building cost in order to be able to put more money on the landscape. Uh, because we are also quite confident that if you have a diversity of, of vegetation, of landscape, then you can allow yourself to go a bit denser in terms of architecture. You can allow yourself to design also simpler buildings because you have a diversity that is already there from uh, the landscape. This is just a view of what it will look like from the street. So you have this front garden that you find everywhere in the city and so there's a quite good integration also of the project within the neighborhood. And we are currently working also on another project which we call Proximate Living, which is for a social uh, housing developer. It's in the northern part of Bordeaux. It's uh, 22 dwellings. It's on a site which is a bit more constrained in terms of, of, um, of, uh, of proportions because it's uh, very, very deep. It's 140 meters deep. Uh, and here we are working well, on the same 5x5 five five grid, but the units are not uh, the same size. But we still use this grid, and we have a project which is some collective units put together and some individual units. Parking is, is dealt with on the front entrance, uh, so there's a pergola uh, above the parking structure. And then there is a system of, a, uh, of small units always grouped together three by three uh, that create something which is quite close in terms of relationships, but as you can see, you never look uh, you never look at uh, uh, directly at uh, the neighbor uh, in this situation. Uh, so you have a, a, an opening up in terms of views, proximity, but still strong individual quality. And the potential to create something that is, at least we feel, much more urban when you do it like that, than if you would just align the buildings here with their own uh, front uh, garage port in front of it. So. This so is just an illustration to show how going from an objective which is creating more urban environment for the quality that we can search for when we speak about urban, from this objective we can move into the architectural typology and, uh, and try to achieve this. 
Now, this issue of how housing relates to a territory and how it needs to be specific also, depending on the context where it is, this also applies for us when we speak about existing units. Uh, we do uh, have a few projects of urban renewal. We work with social housing developers. And I'm just going to show you an ongoing project. I'm not going to go too much into to detail, but just to show you how we work when we go uh, and deal with existing units. This is a neighborhood, again, we are still in the Bordeaux region, in, uh, in, um, in a city that is called Lomo, which is on the other side of the Garonne. And it's a, a site of social housing that was built in the 60s. Uh, and we are working with the city and with the social developers on how we can transform uh, 729 existing dwellings. So here you see where we are located. It's uh, uh, a little bit north from Bordeaux onto the Garonne. And the site looks like this. Uh, it's opening up, up onto the Garonne. Uh, it's quite closed up in terms of infrastructure because you have the highway that is going uh, around it. Uh, but it's really opening up to the, to the west and to the Garonne. And it's also in a very specific topographic situation because you are uh, standing on, if you have, here you are on the lower side. And here you have uh, the hills that go up. And so when you are here, you are 50 meters above this point, which you cannot maybe really tell in this image, but there is a, a real strong relationship to the topography and to the existing landscape again. Here you see an image of, of the building types that you have and this, uh, this relationship to the, to the topography. And essentially it's a slab-like uh, development uh, where most buildings are completely identical uh, to each other. Uh, but you have this really nice relationship to the to the landscape and with really nice views. Here you are looking towards the Grand uh, River in the, in the bottom and you are uh, situated in this hill uh, kind of park. This is what the units, uh, the buildings look like uh, a little bit closer and um, really what is quite remarkable or quite uh, strange also is that this diversity and this uh, strength of the landscape and the relation of the environment is really not felt when you when you look at the buildings, which are very close off um, with uh, with few qualities in terms of exterior spaces. And again, we are speaking about Bordeaux, which is a city where the climate is quite nice, and you want to be outside. Uh, and everyone has a small loggia, uh, which you will see, which is quite qualitative. But of course, in terms of renovation, when we are going to, to insulate these buildings, uh, we are doing it from the outside. There's a certain layer and this whole loggia, uh, which is today quite nice, with, a, a, uh, with nice window openings, will completely change through this insulation process. So this is just a, a grid that we did of the 33 uh, units, uh, new buildings that are concerned by this project of renovation or uh, demolition reconstruction. It is, um, it, the whole site um, has about 1,300 dwellings and there has been a first phase of renovation that went on from 2005 up until 2012. Uh, it's, um, it was a national project. Renovation is, is um, uh, quite often national in, uh, in France. And, but there was all these units here uh, that were not concerned by this renovation where nothing was done. And so the, the question was really here today, what should we do with these, uh, with these units? So we put them here because what is quite, quite um, specific is that all the plants are the same, more or less. You have three typologies. You have a tower, which is the first one, and then you have very thin slab-like developments, and you have thicker slab-like developments. But it's, they all have the typical same floor plan. Uh, but when you go into them, and you, uh, you visit them, and you talk to the people who live there, uh, they all have very different relationships to the outside because of this landscape, which is very different. Here you are looking, we're in the tower, and we're looking out towards the south. Uh, here we're in the building that is really in connection to the park, so there's a real uh, immediate proximity. Here we are uh, visiting someone who lives in a, in a higher level of the, of the units and that is overlooking the port uh, activity from of the Garonne. 
here's someone who's looking at the park further away. Uh, here you have someone who has a, a really strong relationship to the, to the big bridge uh, that is crossing the, the Gavana River and who loves this, this view. And what you really can start to get a sense of is that even though all the floor plans are exactly the same, the way they are uh, inhabited are not really the same also because of their relationship to the outside. And the people spoke very differently about their housing unit whether they are, had a view, or they didn't have a view, or they were connected to the, to the park. And so what we did is we, we started to look at uh, buildings uh, trying to relate to this environment. And we came up with, uh, this we discussed also with the inhabitants, we came up with a series of criteria uh, to be able to uh, judge the building in its relationship to the environment, uh, whether it was directly close to the park, if it has a, had an open view, uh, if it had a south exposition, an east exposition, a west exposition, if it had direct uh, contact with another unit, if it was a, I don't know how you say it in English, but this vis-a-vis -vis condition, where you, at least where the people in the building felt that the distance was close and that this was uh, deranging, so it was in gray. Uh, and uh, the last one was if there was a lot of noise, because as I said, we are close to the highway. And of course, this was also measured by uh, engineers, but this was also <coughs> something that we asked the people how they felt regarding the, the level of noise in the, in the building. And then we mapped this on, on all the buildings, and all of a sudden, when you look at it like that, they start to be very different. Uh, so you are able to move out from this uh, very generic uh, form of unit and start to look at them also in a very different way. And also start to see the potential of the units in a different way. And uh, then we made, from this, we made a series of choices in terms of what we can do in, in terms of rehabilitation, renovation, but also demolition. Uh, because as you see in gray, there are a few buildings that will be demolished. And of course, this was not done only regarding the environment, which would be totally stupid. Uh, there was a technical uh, analysis of the buildings, but the technical analysis of the buildings says that they're essentially all the same. There was also, we are working with a sociologist and the team who is doing, who is looking at the social occupation in the buildings to see if there are some of them where the conditions are uh, more difficult, if there are more elderly people, or because this is also to be taken into account. And what came out of this was that essentially it's more or less the same also in all the buildings. And uh, then we also looked at the floor, floor plans and their potential of evolution. And here we noted that the evolution was, of course, a little bit different when you looked at the thin slabs, whether looking at the, the larger slabs, but um, but that's about the difference that you have. And so one of the elements to be able to also make a difference was regarding the environment. And one of the choices that we, that we also uh, made with the, with the city, the developer, and the inhabitants is to say that, for instance, if uh, one of these units is being demolished, if it adds a lot of quality to one of the existing buildings, then that could also be an argument to say that you can look at it and say, we have two buildings, we are going to renovate them both uh, in a, with a little bit of money, and uh, we are going to see how long it stands for, let's say, 15 years. Or we can say we demolish one of them also, and all of a sudden we add uh, clear quality to the second one because he gets a view, uh, for, for instance, instead of just being close to the other one. And we can put also more money into trying to make a renovation that would hold for much longer than, than 15 years. So this was something that we that we did, and it was a way of moving forward also and trying to make choices, conscious choices, but relating to an environment and to, to the fact that even though these buildings all look the same, you don't live the same in them. And there is always a relationship between the housing condition, the unit that you live in, and the urban environment. And so uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but now we are looking at uh, more technical aspects and how these buildings can evolve. And one of the, the, of course, one of the requirements that we have imposed is that for each of them, uh, there should be tomorrow, in terms of renovation, a clear and quite generous exterior space. Uh, because, as I said, the loggia will be included within, the, more or less, within the building, and so, so we need to add that. And uh, here, for example, you see the, the tower model. On the tower model, we are working on a stronger extension, building even more units. 
this relates to the fact that, for example, the tower is the only uh, building today where there are uh, existing elevators. So it's uh, possible to make much more accessible units if we add on to, to that. So we are uh, looking at the different uh, uh, renovation potentials. But again, I'm just going back to uh, this image, which is of this little loggia that you have within the buildings, uh, which is interesting because it connects the living room. On one side you have a bathroom, and on the other you have the kitchen. So you have this kind of uh, almost house condition with, with the loggia that you will lose tomorrow. And so we are, are working with the developers to create new exterior spaces that will be generous. But also, and this is a reference of a project by Sogen uh, Dumont, uh, in Switzerland, but also what we're really focusing on trying to do is also to be able to keep the qualities that the people have. As you can see here, there is a, um, a blue um, sheet that is, uh, and you think that it's uh, drying, but it's not drying, it's actually someone who has put it there because it provides shade and a certain comfort. And as you move around in the neighborhood, you see it a lot. People have put in their own kind of systems. And so uh, one of the requirements that we are working hard to impose on the developer, because he said this money issue, and you know, but is to say that in the exterior space, there should be uh, curtains, which maybe we can try to choose also the color of the inhabitants, so that uh, even though the building will change, and even though we create new relationships to the exterior, that you can also keep a certain amount of the, of the living quality that you have from the beginning, in, because some of the people who live there have lived there for more than 20 or even 30 years. Uh, so this was just another way of demonstrating for us, again, the relationship between housing and, and, uh, uh, and the access space. I have no idea what time it is, or uh, if we have a little bit more. There's still time. Okay, great. I'm going to finish with another city then. Um, moving up to Stockholm, uh, to a project that we have uh, done this year, and uh, that uh, relates again to the issue of housing. Sweden is a, an interesting uh, city or a country to, to look at right now in terms of housing, because there is quite a big housing crisis. This is due to the fact that um, during the, between 1965 and 1975, uh, there was a program in Sweden implemented which was called the Million Program, where the state built, for during 10 years, built 1 million housing units. It was a quite a remarkable effort, it was done, and, and uh, now, of course, people are criticizing what was being built, but it has held up ever since, in a way, and uh, there was a, a public initiative to really try to provide decent, good housing for people. Once this million houses was built, and it was mostly collective, but there was also individual housing, uh, the public more or less stopped uh, their involvement, and it has been market-driven development ever since, and especially in the 90s, uh, and this related, of course, in much less being built, and uh, that added to the fact that there is a big demographic development in Sweden due to internal uh, uh, birth, but also to, to immigration. Uh, there is a housing shortage that has been building up now for 20 years, where the public has done nothing, uh, and it has all sort of exploded in the last couple of years. Now, this is all we speak about in Sweden, really, it's on the news every day we speak about the housing crisis. And so, this was a, a project that we did uh, this year, which I'm showing because it's a little bit specific and it really relates to the, the issue of the housing shortage. It's uh, on a site in the northern part of Stockholm. It's uh, this weird elephant shape that you, that you can see here. Uh, it's on an existing green, empty site, natural site. And so one can, of course, wonder why would you go and build there. <clears throat> but what is happening today in Sweden, for example, is that the public is saying that we are going to build entirely new towns, plan new towns out of the, outside of the, of the big cities. Uh, in order to accommodate all the, the housing that we need. So they are starting to plan new towns of about 30,000 inhabitants in different, in different areas. And this is, of course, criticized also by, by a lot of people who say that we have the potential to do it more within uh, the city center. And this is one of these sites. It's, uh, uh, it's empty, but it's still in quite close proximity to the city center, and it's especially close because there's a subway line that is going through uh, the site. As you can see here, uh, the site is here, and so the city center of Stockholm is here, and there's a subway line that goes all the way here, 
uh, to Shista, which is uh, like uh, the Swedish Silicon Valley, a little bit development. And there's an existing but closed subway station right here, uh, which was actually built but never opened. And so the empty land is, is really located uh, potentially right next to a subway station, which is 15 minutes from central Stockholm. So the developer who owns the land is saying today that, well, here is some potential to densify and to do uh, a large amount of housing uh, more connected to the city without trying to go as far away as to, uh, to new towns. So, so it's really an, an, an initiative. And then there was a second uh, part of the, um, the exercises that, of course, they are here. You can see uh, the, the subway that is going underground. The existing station is actually here. And here we have the, the Silicon Valley, the city center of Stockholm is, is over here. And you can see this whole green area. Um, and so since they are uh, asking to, to build on a green area, uh, they have come up with the idea to, uh, to try to say we are going here to build a very a sustainable city. And, and so the, the question that was asked to us and to two other teams that, that worked in a workshop mode, it was not a competition. The, the task was not to design a master plan for, for dwellings, but was to work on different kind of prototypes uh, in order to try to uh, work towards a sustainable city and to, to a concept that they call living qualities within planetary boundaries. And this relates to a model of sustainability which looks like a donut, uh, which is a model that has been uh, invented by Kate Rawler, a British uh, scholar, uh, and she speaks of sustainability just like a donut. So that you have the inner ring in the middle, I'm going to go back to that. You have a donut, you have the inner ring, which is the social foundation that everyone should have access to and, and, and the base on which we should all stand. And then you have the outer ring, which is the planetary boundaries, above which we should not go if we want to uh, remain sustainable. And so the developer asks us the question, well, how can we design a city here that stays within the boundaries of, of this donut? And as I said, they didn't ask for a master plan, um, they selected three teams, and so um, we worked with Swedish architects uh, at Lingos uh, with the Dreisaitl, German uh, office, with the Transolar, also German office, and the Traktebel, who is a mobility expert from, uh, from Belgium. And there were two other teams, and we worked for four days in Stockholm on site, in the, which is the science city, um, trying to come up with solutions and trying to come up with proposals that would not be a fixed master plan, but that would be prototypes. And the only thing that the developer asked us was to say, the city, in order to open the station, is asking that there will be tomorrow 15,000 people using the site. So this amounts to roughly 6,000 dwellings, plus about 50% extra in terms of activities, where people come and work. So that was the program. And from that, we, we, we were asked to develop physical structures, uh, prototypes, in four days. So it was a quite challenging way of, of working, but again, for us it was very interesting because you had the opportunity to talk about housing, but also talk about the impact that it has on <coughs> urban form and on built structure. And so we, uh, we started in a workshop mode to discuss all the, let's say, ingredients uh, that the city should, uh, should have. So these are uh, physical ingredients, but also social aspects uh, in terms of, um, of housing, for example. I can just go into that one. Uh, this is a, a quick drawing that we made in terms of what the objectives would be in terms of life quality within this new city. Uh, so we, we spoke about the relationship to nature because you have a great natural environment. So whether you're in a collective dwelling or an individual, you should have this access. We spoke about affordability and evolutivity of housing. Of course, this is just the beginning of concept. This is not a fixed uh, end solution. And uh, many problems are not solved here, but it's a way of starting to, to uh, discuss a lot of different elements within, within a prototype. We spoke about in terms of urbanity, about shared economy, about common spaces, etc. And we also, these are plans made by El Dino Skechon, we also worked on, on, on the grid system, housing typologies, and really started to test things. This was all done uh, 
uh, more or less at the same time. And then we started to, to work on a theoretical scale of, a, of, a, of an urban uh, prototype, which was 200 by 200 meters. And as you can see, this is the scale of, of one prototype on the site. And it allowed us to quite quickly, within four days, to start to discuss both the quality of housing, the way it can start to form an urban structure, uh, but also to be able to measure quite quickly the critical mass that we needed. Because we were not able to, and we didn't want to do a master plan, but we, it was necessary in some way also to be able to control what is 6,000 wellings. How can we be sure that on site, with what we design as a prototype, the 6,000 wellings actually fit? So we worked on this theoretical square size. And what was also really interesting is that each team had um, been provided an expert in terms of uh, virtual reality. So we did experiments, and he was there with his whole equipment. And every time we had something, he put it into his computer. And then we were able to, with these uh, things, to look at and, and walk around and to see um, to see the space that it, that it generates also. And the idea with the developer was to say, you have to come up with a physical structure in four days. And of course, it's just a prototype. So a prototype is made to be perfected. So from that, we will assess, we will see, and we will, uh, we will analyze, and then we will go into prototype mode uh, uh, to the second one. So it was really not seen as a, as a final development. But we came up in these four days, we came up with two prototypes which you can see here, the, the red is the housing, of course, but you also have the blue, which is the economic activities. And we designed two very different prototypes, but still, uh, that for us worked in a complementary way. This is one that we call High Campus. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the project, but the idea was to create a continuity between the Silicon Valley on the north and, and the urban development that it has, and create a kind of campus-like uh, quality. Also, no cars. That was the requirement within the project. So we worked a lot about on the scale of the of the exterior spaces and of mobility systems that could exclude completely uh, individual car ownership. And so this was called High Campus. It's on a uh, 200 by 200 meter. It's on a 7.5 by 7.5 grid here, and it's a density of 200 volts per hectare. This is an image that uh, uh, perspective is done, which I don't. Which is beautiful, but the, it's difficult to like because it's really not something that can be judged in an image like that. What is more interesting for us is to be able to have a physical form and then to be able to start to discuss about everything that we want the city to contain and how we want it to work and to try to see can it work with this. So it's it's more interesting to actually look at the plan and the dimensions and the than than to speak about the physical, let's say, image that, that the, the perspective generates. And then there was a second prototype, which was called the low campus, which was uh, envisioned much more in relationship, direct relationship to the nature. And it was the idea also that we, we should be able to find different living qualities within the city, uh, since we are not in the city center. And uh, uh, so here we have a much lower density of about 50 volumes per hectare, but we still have 50 of productive spaces within the city, still a no car uh, system. This was a, a quick image that was made for, for this area. And uh, here you have them uh, both together. Um, and of course, this is a theoretical exercise um, on a square, uh, which is not situated in a specific environment. Uh, but we had very specific discussions about the, the contents of this. And then we also did in parallel a work of how this relates to the site. And so here you have the topography of the site, which is a traditional uh, Swedish landscape of these um, hills, rock hills that are uh, existing, as you can see here. Uh, and the site is, is here. And so uh, we did some experiments. Again, this is a four-day period that we are talking about. But to try to see how, if we use this prototype, as an urban fabric, and we start to implement it. One, do we have the critical mass? Yes, we do. We have 6,000 dwellings in there, and we are really able to, to show it. And, and the second, and this is the most important, how does it integrate into the site? And so, as you see, it is not in the end, this is just a quick sketch, but you can see that it starts to relate to the topography, that it starts to relate to the natural qualities, 
that there is a transportation system, connections with the existing neighborhoods that start to, to emerge. And it was really a way for us also, um, using this prototype method of the of theoretical square of the urban fabric, uh, was a method for us to uh, really going back and forth between the quality of what kind of life you would want to have here uh, tomorrow and the, uh, the question of quantity, again, because it comes back uh, to this. And so, just to, to finish up, this is, uh, you can see the two prototypes, uh, which are here, that we developed. And the other ones are just a few other ones that we, uh, that we have done for other projects. And it's a, it's a scale that we like to use in the office. We also redraw existing urban fabrics on this theoretical scale of 200 by 200, because it's a scale that we feel is really able to speak about the quality of the city, of the city of housing, um, but also uh, uh, the diversity that you can that you can start to expect uh, out of um, an urban fabric. And just to finish, I, I would like to read this quote by uh, Scottish landscape architect Ian McHart uh, that you may have or may not have heard of, uh, but who was uh, one of the pioneers in terms of ecological uh, planning and. Uh, um, Again, a landscape architect, and he, he spoke a lot about form. And I will just read this one because it's uh, for us, it sums up, uh, I think, the, uh, our whole conception of, of the city and the relationship to housing. Form and process are indivisible aspects of a single phenomenon. There is no such thing as an abstract form, there is no such thing as a capricious form or unmeaningful form. Form and process are indivisible. If one wishes to describe an atom, molecule, crystal, or compound, one can describe it only in formal terms. If one wishes to describe a cell, a tissue, organ, organism, or ecosystem, one can do so only in formal terms. All form is meaningful. Thank you. that we don't like, 
we dislike is the, the role of the urban planner uh, in the world today, which is very often, um, at least in France, it, it's a position where we tend to um, celebrate complexity where we tend to want to explain how complex the world is and how no one else except for us can understand it. And, um, and it's, it's very absurd in a time where at the same time we start to work a lot with public participatory processes. But we often, very often see people that are involved in participatory processes and that at the same time do not believe in them at all because they, uh, uh, they, they, they want they want us to believe also that, uh, that the city is complex. And of course it is complex, it is very complex, but we feel that there is a possibility to, to speak about it also in formal terms. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can draw a simple drawing of the city today, but it means that every urban condition or situation uh, can be comprehended also in formal terms and that it can help us in a certain way. And we don't have the potential to, to be able to say that form can solve everything, but it can become um, um, a way of discussing things differently. And I would say in that sense, yes, we are a bit unfrench and maybe closer to the um, Anglo-Saxon world uh, where, uh, where there is also a way of speaking of design more freely than, than in France. As in terms of, of what inspires us, I, I, uh, it's very difficult for us to name uh, uh, to name a few architects or to say. I mean, you see, we've shown you a few uh, a few projects of architects that we we find are, are very interesting. But um, I would say it's from our background. We were educated in Versailles. It's a school that has a relationship to the territory. You look at the the gardens of the Nôtre, and uh, uh, this is the French Quarter, which is certainly something that inspires us also in the qualities that it can that it can provide. I, I grew up in Sweden, so I'm very um, I feel very close to the Swedish modernism, which is a more rooted one, which is a uh, something that is uh, not like the French modernism, but uh, um, well, you all know the Aspen, but there are other ones too, and um, who have a, a, a say more of a domestic approach to to modernism, and that is something that, that inspires us. But we are also very inspired by, by graphic designers, and especially uh, American and English ones, because they have, for us, the graphic designer, much more than the architect, have the capacity also to, to put complex questions on the table and to try to speak of them in, in a simple way. And I think that's a, something that we feel is, um, is very important, because we don't want to have this double language, of having one way of speaking to the, the people, the inhabitants that we deal with in the public participatory process, and another way of speaking with the mayor. So if, uh, uh, the, if one way is more childish, then we prefer the childish way, even if it's sometimes weird for the French mayor to be confronted to that, and we have, we have seen it, but I think it's a, uh, it's a day to day process, and uh, after a while, at least in Bordeaux, they have started to acknowledge this kind of similar way of, of uh, of speaking about uh, speaking about things. I don't know if it answered your question. Yeah. I, my question picks up on that um, in a way too. Um, many people are concerned with the issue of kind of uh, intensifying an existing context. And often the method uh, has to do with kind of specific scenes the simplicity of technology in particular ways. And you break with that uh, completely and the thing that I need to mention. The thing that um, I find most intriguing is that you bring models from a completely liberal uh, uh, business system, namely Arizona, California, uh, for in a way uh, the philosophy, the ring philosophy flip the market and solve the problem. And you found some extraordinary beautiful solutions and bring them to France, which is, you know, exactly the opposite. When you look at the um, typologies of the Arizona model and the French things that you found, the French stuff feels very stiff and very tight. And I sort of feel that there's, in, in a way, you're saying that maybe the local um, this game is not, this was 
water and the genome is not relevant anymore. We're working with a, with a globalized uh, reference field. Is that true? <laughs> not entirely. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say so, no. Um, no, it's press it's relevant. I mean, you don't... Um, I mean, I came to the suburb. It was the first time I, uh, I came here and I walked all the way here. Um, and it's... Uh, From Paris. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about... Uh, <laughs> uh, so I walked through uh, the city and uh, uh, it's not the same as Paris. Uh, it's, um, it's Europe, it's a uh, four hour train ride, but it's not the same. And um, I would say, and we, we were in New York a couple of, of weeks ago and we said the thing, same thing. It doesn't, for us, it's, it has nothing to do with the shops because when I mean, you see, you walk out from Harper, the first thing you see is Starbucks. And when you leave from the central station in, in Paris, the first thing you see is uh, uh, the last thing you see is the Starbucks. So it has nothing to do with the shops, but it's the urban structures and, uh, and uh, but the culture is different. And I think it's still very much different. I feel like from, from uh, France to Sweden. So I would say that the context still very much count, but the problem of making it only about the context is that um, you are being completely um, overlooked in a way and, and you are missing out on it because what is happening is that housing and, and the way we produce it is produced in a global uh, way and uh, um, I mean the, the things are going so so fast and uh, so it's, it's not possible to just uh, uh, just speak about the local context also I mean you have to again you go you go back and forth between architecture and urban planning and, and I think we very much go back and forth between Global. We speak a lot about at the office about halfway design, um, which is uh, the idea that yes, if you are to build a lot of, of new housing units, which which is the case, and, uh, and we're not even speaking about Asia, but even just in the European context, then you can you they need to relate to the local territory, and, and I think that that's very important for us. But you also need to be and you need to accept that you cannot, uh, maybe you cannot inscribe yourself fully uh, uh, in that sense. And maybe it's easier for us to do it because we are not only building, we are, we are working a lot with urban planner. I think as, as, a, as only an architect, it's, it's much harder to, to do that. And it, uh, it's facilitated for us that we work with urban planner. But uh, um, you cannot overlook the reality in a global way. I mean, the project that I spoke about in Bordeaux, they are uh, uh, trying to discuss, and we know that every architect tries to discuss this about materials, for example. What kind of materials can we can we use, which are not only local, but which are which ones are the most sustainable, for example. Uh, and no one is able to give us an answer on that. No one, not, not even the, the office that deals with sustainability. Because in a way, people are living in such a global uh, system thinking when it comes to how we build, for example, that um, it's, it's counterproductive for us to only inscribe ourselves in the, in the local system. And the reality is that when you go to Phoenix, which is, yes, the most, one of the most absurd cities I have seen, well, the fact is that this is where you find one of the most urban individual humans in the world. And by an architect who was a uh, was fascinated by this on the road, but really believed in the fact that architecture could um, could help people live better. And who, uh, who did a project that he built himself, uh, that he lived in with himself with his family, and who was everything but uh, living in this liberal uh, system in a way. So I think going very far sometimes and making specific references makes sense. You just have to know why you choose them. That we try to be specific about that also. That it's every time we have a reference, it's for a purpose, and it can be regarding the plan, it can be regarding the process. But uh, we have to know where it comes from and why we choose it.